Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Civil Engineering. This is a lab manual in Unit 9. Section 1 Designing Skyscrapers. The world's largest shake table. The world's largest shake table is inside a giant warehouse in Japan. The table is a 20 meter by 15 meter or 65 foot by 49 foot moving platform. Underneath the table are pistons. Pistons are devices that can, be, that can move up and down. The pistons are controlled by computers that move the table in all directions to mimic the swaying of the ground caused by real life earthquakes. Civil engineers from around the world travel to this shake table. Civil engineers design and supervise the construction of structures used by many people. They test different structures to see if they can withstand the destructive forces of a major earthquake. A structure is anything that is made of parts and can support and withstand all of the forces that act on it. Earthquakes in Japan. Japan is a leader in designing earthquake-resistant technologies because it experiences about 1,500 earthquakes every year. This is because the country is located along the Ring of Fire. This is the most active earthquake zone in the world. It is where several tectonic plates collide with one another, including the, specific, the Pacific Plate, the Philippine Sea Plate, and the Eurasia Plate. Japan experiences many earthquakes because it is located along the Ring of Fire. Designing earthquake resistant structures. When two tectonic plates suddenly slip past one another, there is a sudden release of energy that causes the ground to shake, producing earthquakes. Earthquakes produce seismic waves that travel outward from the disturbance through Earth's rocks. It is the energy carried in these waves that damages structures. Scientists measure earthquakes on the moment magnitude scale. This scale goes from zero to nine plus, depending on the amount of energy an earthquake releases. Moment magnitude scale, level zero to one, north, no earthquake activity. Level one to two, movement only detected by seismograph. Level two to three, hanging objects may sway. Level three to four, may break windows, cause small objects to fall. Level four to five, furniture moves, plaster falls from walls. Level five to six, severe damage to poorly built structures. Level six to seven, buildings displaced from foundations, cracks in earth. Level seven to eight, bridges destroyed, few structures left standing. Nine and over, near total destruction. Developing the shake table. In 1995, a major earthquake struck Kobe, a city in Japan. This earthquake had a magnitude of 6.8. The Kobe earthquake damaged about 150,000 structures in the region. The damage surprised many people who thought that at least some of the buildings could survive a major earthquake. In response, engineers and others in Japan began developing the giant shake table. They wanted to be able to better predict how much damage earthquakes of different magnitudes would cause. They also wanted to evaluate the safety of different structures before they were built. Now, people can build full-size models of a structure and place them on the shake table. They can then recreate earthquakes of different magnitudes and observe exactly where the structure is weakest. This can help them design stronger, more earthquake-resistant structures. Forces that act on structures. Because Japan experiences so many earthquakes, all buildings in Japan have to follow earthquake resistant building standards. This is especially important for skyscrapers, which are tall buildings with many stories that can contain many people in a vertical space. Even without earthquakes, many forces act on a skyscraper. Forces that act on structures are called loads. For example, the weight of the structure itself is called the dead load. This includes anything permanently attached to the structure, including its floors, walls, roof, columns, beams, nuts, and bolts. 
the weight of anything that moves in or on the structure is called the live load. This includes people and furniture. How forces act on a skyscraper. Every floor pushes down on the walls and floors below. As gravity pulls down on structures and the ground pushes back up, it compresses the structure. Compression happens when forces push the ends of an object toward each other. This makes objects become shorter. Some materials compress easily. Other materials are harder to compress. Tension happens when forces pull the ends of an object in opposite directions. Tension makes an object longer. Materials such as stone and brick break easily when tense. Even concrete must be reinforced with steel to handle tension before it can be used safely to construct beams. A beam will snap if it experiences too much tension without the support of columns. So here's a picture of skyscrapers in New York City. The permanent features of a structure are its dead load. Bending happens when forces cause tension on one side of an object or material and compression on the other side. Shear describes what happens when forces push one part of a structure one way and another part the opposite way. Finally, torsion happens when forces cause an object to twist. Materials that withstand forces. The skyscraper has to be very strong so it can withstand all of these forces. Engineers carefully select which materials to use. For example, steel is one of the strongest materials used in construction. Steel is a synthetic material. Synthetic materials are formed through a chemical process developed by humans, as opposed to those of natural origin. Steel is made up of iron and other elements, primarily carbon. It won't crack or break in response to strong compression or tension. It is also low cost. Reinforced concrete is another material commonly used when designing skyscrapers. Like steel, reinforced concrete is synthetic. It is made up of concrete mixed with steel. Because it is reinforced with steel, it can withstand strong compression and tension. So here's a diagram of torsion, shear, and bending. Here's a picture of steel, and here's one of reinforced concrete. Structure of a skyscraper. Engineers also think about shapes when designing a skyscraper. This is because some shapes are better able to resist the forces of compression, tension, torsion, and shear than other shapes. Geometric shapes, such as triangles, squares, and rectangles, usually perform better than unbalanced or irregular shapes because of how they distribute forces. Engineers often add beams to squares and rectangles to create triangles. Squares and rectangles can be strong when forces push straight down on them. However, if a strong force pushes sideways, a square or rectangle cannot hold its shape. Adding a diagonal beam to create a triangle strengthens the shape. Parts of a skyscraper. As a result, the frame of a skyscraper looks like a jungle gym. It is made up of vertical columns, horizontal beams, and diagonal cross supports. Their purpose is to handle forces from all directions. The columns support the beams. The beams support the downward force of each floor's weight. All of the weight in the building gets transferred directly to the vertical columns. It is then transferred to the foundation. The foundation supports the weight of the structure. A skyscraper needs a deep foundation to resist compression forces. Many skyscrapers also have a central core. This is the stiff backbone of the skyscraper. It is the central vertical beam that holds the skyscraper in place. The central core is often made of concrete and steel. The cross supports help the central core resist shear and tension forces. Dynamic loads. The central core has another function. It helps to support the skyscraper from the force of the wind. When the wind blows on a structure, it is called wind load. Wind is a major concern in skyscrapers. As it blows, wind applies a pushing force against structures in its path. The side of the skyscraper in the wind will experience tension. The other side will experience compression. Wind sometimes blows harder on the top floors than on the lower floors. 
This can cause both shear and torsion forces. Civil engineers want the buildings to sway a little in high winds so they don't get damaged. Engineers test different materials to see which works best to resist forces. Earthquakes. In an earthquake, buildings and other structures experience a lateral shaking force. This is called earthquake load. This force usually occurs parallel to the ground. Engineers who build in Japan and other places that experience earthquakes design buildings that can withstand as much sideways motion as possible. This is what the shake table tests. When a structure is placed on the table, the table then moves horizontally to mimic the motion of an earthquake. This building is being tested on Japan's giant shake table. Designing for earthquakes. Civil engineers brace buildings for earthquakes by making all the parts of a building, such as the walls and the roof, act as a system during earthquake vibrations. One example of this is called base isolation. With base isolation, the skyscraper doesn't sit directly on the ground. Instead, it floats on rubber pads, springs, or padded cylinders. The rubber pads, springs, or cylinders absorb the seismic waves. This keeps the waves from reaching the building. Pendulums. Another strategy is to build a massive pendulum at the top of the building. The pendulum opposes the sway of the building during an earthquake. The force of the earthquake first pushes the base of the skyscraper in the same direction as the seismic waves. For a, mo for a moment, the top of the building doesn't move. The top of the building quickly moves in the same direction that the base had moved. However, by then, the base has moved back in the opposite direction. Pendulums automatically sway in the direction opposite to the motion created by the earthquake. This absorbs some of the energy of the seismic waves. It reduces the vibrations that shake the building. Section 2. Designing Bridges. Designing Structures that Benefit Society. When Miguel Rosales was in middle and high school, his favorite class was art. He now uses art in his job because Miguel is an engineer and architect who designs bridges. Miguel enjoys designing bridges because they have such an important role in society. A bridge is a structure that allows humans to cross obstacles such as valleys or bodies of water. The span is the distance a bridge crosses unsupported from below. Designing Boston's Zocking Bridge. Miguel was the lead architect and designer for the Leonard B. Zocking Bunker Hill Bridge. This bridge crosses the Charles River in Boston, Massachusetts. The bridge took 10 years to complete. Miguel worked hard on the bridge's design. He wanted it to fit into its surroundings. Before construction on the bridge began, Miguel made many 3D drawings and models. He also made computer drawings so he could see how the bridge would appear when it was complete. Like skyscrapers, bridges have to balance all of the forces acting on them. A well-built bridge doesn't fail because it is made of shapes and materials that balance these forces. Here's a picture of Miguel Rosales. And here's Boston's Akim Bridge crosses the Charles River. Miguel Rosales was the lead architect and designer for this bridge. Design of bridges. Compression happens on the deck of roadway, a deck or roadway of a bridge. The weight of people walking or cars driving puts downward pressure on the structure. If a bridge experiences too great a load without enough upward support, it will buckle or break. Tension happens as traffic on the roadway causes the underside of the bridge to become longer. If a bridge experiences too much tension on the bottom with an out, without enough support, it will snap. Different bridge designs handle the forces that act on the bridge in different ways, such as by transferring force from an area of weakness to an area of strength. Zakam Bridge Design. The Zakam Bridge is a kind of cable stayed bridge. This is a bridge design that includes one or more towers with cables that run directly from the tower to the roadway. Cables are very strong pieces of rope made of steel wire. 
the cables running directly from the tower to the deck form the distinctive fan-like pattern you see in the Zackham Bridge. Cable stay bridges are similar to another bridge design called a suspension bridge. Engineers design cable stay bridges or suspension bridges when they need to span long distances. To suspend means to hang in the air. Suspension bridges are bridges with long cables that hold up the roadway. The deck of the suspension bridge is attached to two towers by cables, ropes, or chains. As weight pushes down on the deck, the compression forces are transferred up the cables, ropes, or chains to the towers. The towers then spread out the compression forces directly into the ground. Tension on the bridge is transferred to the supporting cables, which run horizontally between two anchorages. Bridge and anchorages are solid rock or massive concrete blocks that ground the bridge. The tension passes to the anchorage, anchorages and into the ground. So here's a diagram of a suspension bridge. Engineers design beam bridges to span short distances. Beam bridges are short bridges with a roadway supported by columns called piers. A beam bridge is made up of a long flat piece of material like wood, concrete, or steel. This beam is placed on top of an embankment. If the distance gets too long, then the beam part of the bridge can flex and break. So piers are needed to shorten the span for support. Most bridges that go over highways are beam bridges. Here's a model of a beam bridge. A truss bridge is a modified beam bridge made with many diagonal cross supports called trusses. Truss bridges add triangles to the shape of a beam bridge to make it stronger. Remember that triangles are the building blocks of many structures because they can bear large loads without losing their shape. Because of their shape, truss bridges use materials efficiently. This makes them economical to build. However, like beam bridges, truss bridges can only span a short distance. An arch bridge is another variation of the beam bridge that can span greater distances. Its roadway is held up by a semicircle curve unsupported by piers. Arch bridges use curved arches to transfer the downward weight of the roadway into two end supports called abutments. Arch bridges need strong abutments. The arch design under the roadway means that all of the weight from the compression on the top of the bridge is sent sideways into the abutments. The abutments support loads passing over the top of the bridge. Because of their design, arch bridges experience very little tension. So here's a diagram of a truss bridge and an arch bridge. I learned a lot reading civil engineering, and I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with the next one. Bye.